Welcome to the Servants of Grace podcast hosted by Dave Jenkins. Our podcast exists to provide trustworthy expository messages through the Bible and faithful answers to your theology questions. Now for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. Well, welcome to our 60th study through the book of Revelation. The title of our study today is Coming Soon. And today we're going to look at Revelation 22, 18 through 21. Would you pray with me now? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. That the grace of God not only saves us, but that this grace is with us. And it sustains us, it secures us, it, it, it satisfies us, it, it will glorify us. So Lord, we thank you that your word is true. We thank you, Lord, for your, your help, the help that you've given to me to preach through this book. And as we conclude today, we pray that, that this will be helpful, that it'll encourage your people, that it'll open sinners' eyes, that they might receive you in faith in the Son of God, and the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, I know you guys are excited, and so am I. We're about to finish another book of the Bible today, the book of Revelation. You know, no small thing. So I'm very I'm very thankful for this, this time that uh, we've had to study this book, and um, let's, uh, let's look at... Revelation 22, 18 through 21. Hear what the word of the Lord has to say to us today. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which is described in this book. He who testifies to this thing says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Amen. At the end of Israel's exodus from Egypt and the, and the journey through the Sinai Desert, Moses assembled the twelve tribes on the plains of Moab. There Moses gave the books of Deuteronomy as a constitution for the nation of Israel in the Promised Land. But Deuteronomy was different from Genesis, from Exodus, and Numbers which recounted past history and its lessons, and from Leviticus with its procedures from the priesthood. Deuteronomy explicitly looked forward to the life that the Israelites were entering as a people, with promises and commands pertaining to their their covenant life as a people of God. In this respect, Revelation is a lot like the book of Deuteronomy. The four Gospels record the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The book of Acts tells of the apostolic founding of the church, And the epistles record the doctrine on the practical instructions of the apostles to those churches. Revelation looks explicitly to the church age that was then beginning and would continue until Jesus returns, looking ahead even to an eternity of glory. As the Deuteronomy is written directly to Israel as as the departed, the Exodus generation, Revelation was given to the churches emerging out of the apostolic age into the gospel millennium. It entails the promises and the obligations of the church's life as God's covenant people in Jesus Christ. One signal that the Apostle John saw Revelation as a new book of Deuteronomy is the warning that he attaches to Revelation 22, 18 through 19. He directs these words to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. The warning threats anyone who adds to them and adds who takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy. This warning mirrors similar words that occur in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy 4, 2, Moses commanded, You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it that you you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. And so in John's plain language, the apostle is warning readers neither to add nor take away from Revelation, saying that for the one who adds to it, in verse 22, or Revelation 22, 18 through 19, God will add to him the plagues described in the book. To him who takes away, God will take away his share 
in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. While the language of this warning is clear, John's precise meaning, it requires some explanation. First, John is not insisting that Revelation is the final book of the, of the biblical canon so that no other books could be added after it. It is true, though, that we need to say that no scripture was written after Revelation, as the early church affirmed, and as Christians it should insist to today. It's also true that John wrote by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and the divine author surely knew that Revelation would conclude the biblical canon. And still, John's warning specifically concerns the words of the prophecy of this book, Revelation 22.18, that is, Revelation itself. Now, some scholars have suggested that John's remarks were directed to scribes who would later copy Revelation and who must be exact and correct in their work. One reason for this view is that the early church letter to Aristides contains such a warning, in similar language to John. But this isn't John's meaning, since he speaks to everyone who hears the prophecy of Revelation, verse 18, and not just those who copy it. Third, John does not teach here that true believers who have been saved through faith in Christ alone can subsequently lose our salvation because of a sin against this text. This idea may be suggested by the language in verse 19, which says God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city. And yet John's writings elsewhere make it clear that a true believer can never lose salvation. And John 6.37, Jesus promised, Whoever comes to me I will never cast out. In 1 John 2.19, John explains that those who seem to have fallen away were never true believers. For if they had been of us, they would, they would have continued with us. John's warning does not therefore mean that true believers can lose the salvation that they once possessed, but rather that those who are unfaithful to God's word will be barred from salvation's blessing. For John is not condemning well-meaning believers who make mistake in teaching revelation. We have sometimes noticed differing interpretation between those who hold to you know, dispensational, historical, premillennial, amillennial, or even postmillennial views of eschatology in our study of the book of Revelation. And these differing views and any errors made by them are not willful perversions of this teaching, which, which John means by the idea of adding to or subtracting from his book. And still, John's warning should cause Bible teachers to take their work seriously and remind them not to take lightly the solemn duty involved in teaching the whole counsel of God. And so what then does John precisely mean by the concept of adding to or taking away from the words of Revelation? George Elton Ladd says this, he is not concerned about possible mechanical errors in transmission or mistakes of judgment in interpreting his message, but in deliberate distortions and perversions of it. The answer is suggested by Moses' similar warning in Deuteronomy, since the opposite of adding or taking away was to keep the commandments of the Lord, Deuteronomy 4.2, and to hold fast to the Lord, Deuteronomy 4.4. Those who were judged under this warning were the faithless and the disobedient, Deuteronomy 4.3 says, In the time of Jesus, the Pharisees and the Sadducees best fit the description of this warning. Raymond Brown says, The Pharisees added to the word of God hundreds of detailed prohibitions which are not contained in canonical scripture. In the same period, the Sadducees subtracted from the word the things that they found unacceptable and anything about the supernatural, the doctrine of the resurrection, the angels and the spirit. These two groups find their analogies today in legalists who had man-made works of salvation and liberals who deny plainly taught biblical doctrines. Moreover, adding to or subtracting from Revelation's message is a hallmark of cults and their false prophetic leaders. Examples are Ellen G. White of the Seventh-day Adventists, who claimed to prophecy alter the message of Revelation, and Joseph Smith, the Mormon leader, who claimed to add to Revelation. Those who take away from its message include uh, Charles Taze Russell, whose Jehovah's Witness movement denies Christ's deity and his personal return. These heretics fall under the judgment of God because in rejecting Christ and his gospel, they also tamper with the very word of God. And in recording this threat, John is emphasizing the divine character of the book that he has written. Revelation is true prophecy, the revealed word of God, who now defends its sanctity. Janice Johnson writes, This divine witness is not to be toyed with, he jealously guards the integrity of his word. For it is through this word that he, that he zealously guards his beloved bride from the devil's lies. 
G.K. Beale has a punishment for disobedience is severe since John is not merely writing his own words, but the very words of God. The solemn warning to keep the message of Revelation underscores the particular significance of this book for the church in our time. So we should avoid giving any book of Scripture a superior place over the others since each book has its particular role to play in God's revealed word. And yet, just as Deuteronomy gave covenant rules that apply directly to Israel in the Promised Land, the enthroned Jesus Christ speaks in Revelation directly to his covenant people in the church age. And so, at the very least, Revelation ought to therefore be given careful and reverent attention by Christians today. In, in the seven letters of chapters 2 and 3, Jesus commands his churches to reject false doctrine, to guard themselves against idolatry and sexual impurity, and to keep alive their zeal for his gospel mission. See, Christians today should treat these obligations seriously. Later in Revelation, Jesus made clear that his people must never worship tyrants who usurp the place of God. If John's first readers chose to die rather than worship the image of Caesar, in this way, taking the mark of the beast, Christians today must likewise refuse to grant ultimate authority to any state or any political leader. See, Jesus commands that his church not participate in the filthy practices taught by the harlot Babylon in the form of a seductive secular culture. The sovereign Lord commands his people to persevere in true faith and godliness until he returns to complete our salvation. Revelation 2.10 says, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. You see, there are many voices today that urge Christians to downplay the sovereign commands of Jesus. We're, we're told to mention only the promises and the comforting phrases of the New Testament without the requirements and the warnings. And some even hold and teach the commands and the laws from the Christian life amount to anti-gospel legalism. And yet the, gospel, the book of Revelation shows that Jesus did not hold this view. The sovereign Lord puts commands before his people even as he provides the grace to keep them. And having insisted that his people must overcome the power of evil by faith, Jesus commands his church to reverently keep the word of God. Revelation 22, 25-26 says, Only hold fast to what you have until I come. The one who overcomes and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nation. In addition to the warning that concludes Revelation, Jesus has a promise to return soon. Revelation 22, 20 says, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Jesus is not far off and, and inattentive, but will soon return to bring both judgment and salvation as we've talked about. And his primary emphasis here is to encourage his faithful disciples who are suffering in the world. Verse 17 we talked about last week says the spirit and the bride called out to the beloved Lord say come and he answers now surely I am coming soon. While well, skeptics point out that 19 centuries have passed since Jesus promised to return soon and yet he has yet to come. The idea however is that Jesus will return without delay and at the very moment when God's redemptive timeline has run its course the Savior will immediately come to gather his followers. While there remains people of his to be saved, Jesus' coming is delayed. For this very reason, the witness of his gospel occupies Christians' attention today. Meanwhile, with every day, Jesus' coming has been brought nearer. We know that in terms of God's prophetic calendar, we are on the brink of his glorious coming. Philip Hughes writes, It is an event that is always eminent, hence the need always to live in expectation of his appearing. And more, most significant is the response of the true church, which replies in anticipation, Amen, come Lord Jesus, Revelation 22.20 20 says. And by saying Amen, the church expresses satisfaction and agreement in the promise of Jesus. The prayer, the final prayer of the Bible, come Lord Jesus, indicates the joyful hope of believers in the return of Christ. The Greek translates the Aramaic expression, Maranatha, so that John's Gentile believers are carrying over the language and the piety of the first believers in Jerusalem. Come, Lord Jesus, is therefore one of the oldest creedal prayers in existence. The Didac, a church manual dated in the late first century, connects this prayer to the early church liturgy of the Lord's Supper. And so we can see that the fervor of the original disciples in that same prayer for Christ's spiritual presence in the sacrament also expressed their longing 
for his physical return and his second coming. This prayer shows the fervent longing of the early Christians for Jesus' return. Tragically, many believers today have been taught to dread the return of Christ as, as an event that may prove disastrous to them. Revelation, however, presents the church as a bride longing for the Lord and the bridegroom to come, animated by the Spirit of Christ come in, in Revelation twenty two seventeen, and and Jesus answers in Revelation twenty two twenty, Surely I am coming soon. And the bride replies with surging hope, Amen, come Lord Jesus. His coming, Paul said in Titus 2.13, is our blessed hope. We are waiting from heaven, he writes, a Savior, the Lord Jesus, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Philippians 3.20-21 and one reason that Christians dread rather than rejoice in the return of Christ is the way that warning passages have been preached to suggest that we may lose everything by slipping up at a, the fatal hour. In the parable of the ten virgins, Jesus tells of the five brides who keep their lamps lit and were there to welcome the Lord and five who did not and were kept out of the wedding feast in Matthew 25, 1-13. But the parable does not discriminate between two kinds of faithful Christians, those who are watching when Jesus returned and were saved, and those who were careless and lost their blessing, rather distinguishes between true Christians and whom the Holy Spirit is alive and false professors of Christianity who do not possess the Holy Spirit. The parable's final appeal in Matthew twenty five thirteen is to watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour it is not meant to lurk in the nightmares of Christians but to give a standard exhortation regarding our need to persevere in faith. And so in Jesus' parable, the talents the Lord promises to reward his faithful servants should inspire us with joyful hope. And so it's true that, that all his loyal disciples must trust and serve Jesus in this life. And when he comes, Jesus will greet them, not just with the famous and the hyperproductive, with the words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master, Matthew 25, 21. Jesus' words of welcome in Matthew 25, 34 should cause us both to serve him faithfully and to pray for his soon return. When it says, come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. Craig Keener tells a story from early in his Christian life that should challenge us all. As a young adult, he, he greatly longed for a marriage partner, and this desire dominated his prayer life. One day, he walked in on a worship service where Christians were fervently singing about Jesus' return. He was struck that, that while he longed for a wife and, and prayed constantly for this earthly companionship, which God had not necessarily promised him, he was thinking nothing about and praying little for the greatest companionship that God had promised. Now, Keener exhorts us, any other longing we have will be but a shadow of our desire for the greatest and truest love available the love to which the Lamb shed his blood stands as an eternal testimony. See, Jesus says in Revelation twenty two twenty, Surely I am coming soon. May our hearts respond in the, in the spirit of John and the first Christian saying, Amen, come Lord Jesus. So central is the theme of Christ's soon return to the Christian faith that we should point out some of its important teachings. First, the return of Christ should produce a serious concern to lead faithful, Bible-obeying lives. Christians have no need to fear condemnation in the coming of Christ, and yet the Bible does teach that, we, that he will look to each of us to see the return on his grace in our lives. Faithful Christians will desire to do as much for Jesus as we can in these days, and will desire that Christ receive a great profit from his investment in our salvation. Moreover, the church should always conduct herself as accountable to her Lord, who, though absent in the body, is present by the Spirit. Not only will Christ physically return to take accounts, but the book of Revelation shows that he rules us now through the Holy Spirit, disciplining wayward believers and supporting his obedient disciples in their need. Second, knowing that Jesus will soon return should animate all believers with a fervent desire for evangelism and world missions. We should be concerned about the spiritual condition of all people, realizing that without faith in Jesus, they are under God's wrath and in danger of terrible judgment when Jesus Christ returns. And moreover, we're told that Jesus will return only, only when the last of his people have been gathered to faith. In this sense, Peter writes that Christians are now waiting for and hastening the coming day of God, Second Peter 3.12 says. 
And therefore, having offered our prayer of Maranatha with the early church believers, we should follow their example of departing from the worship service as devoted witnesses to Christ and his gospel today. And that's an excellent example of this attitude was given by 10-year-old Archibald Alexander Hodge and his sister Mary Elizabeth on June 23, 1833. On that day, the Reverend James R. Eckerd was departing from Princeton Seminary where the children's father was a professor for a missionary service on the island of Quilon. And during the farewell, the children came forward with a letter they had addressed to the people on the island, and it said, Dear heathen, the Lord Jesus Christ hath promised that the time shall come when all the ends of the earth shall be his kingdom. And God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of a man that he should repent. And if this was promised by a being who cannot lie, why do you not help it to come sooner by reading the Bible and attending to the word of your teachers and loving the God and renouncing your idols and take Christianity into your temples? My sister and myself have, by small, by small self-denials, procured two dollars which are enclosed in this letter to buy tracts and bibles to teach you the letter was signed archibald alexander hodge and mary elizabeth hodge friends of the heathen like these wise children we should become friends of the unbelievers through the gospel and be eager to make sacrifices in support of their salvation third the soon return of christ calls on non-believers to repent acknowledge the lordship of jesus and come to him today in faith in christ alone you see, Christ is coming to save his people and also to judge rebels who have refused to pay him homage. I mentioned Jesus' parable of the talents, which shows him as coming back to reward his faithful servants. That parable concludes with a warning of judgment on those who do not trust him and do not serve him, who are cast into the outer darkness in that place where there be weeping and gnashing of teeth, Matthew 25, 30 says. And the urgency of the sinner's need to return to turn to Christ for salvation is illustrated by the events of December 26, 1811, when all the fashionable society of Richmond, Virginia, crowded the city's theater for the opening performance of a popular play. Just before the last act, a lamp caused the stage scenery to catch fire, and within minutes the building was wrapped in flames. Seventy-five people perished, including the governor of the state and many other prominent citizens, including some of the most fashionable ladies of the city. Sermons were preached throughout America in response to this tragedy. And one of them, Archibald Alexander, pointed out that the response of Jesus to a similar calamity in Jerusalem when the Roman governor slew a crowd of Galileans at the temple. And Jesus said, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? He answered that their death was not warranted by any special sins they had committed, but provided a general warning of God's wrath on all those who sub refused to submit in faith to him. Jesus says this in Luke 13, 2-3, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Preaching on this theme, Alexander urged his hearers in words that might be equally suited to the message of Christ's soon return of Revelation, saying this, Receive the warnings then and suffer the word of exhortation. You may never in the whole period of your lives find a season so favorable to shake off the undue influence of the world and become real Christians. John concludes Revelation with a benediction that reminds us that Revelation was a letter sent by the Apostle for the benefit of his churches. And so he concludes saying in Revelation 22, 21, The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. A benediction is both a prayer appeal and a declaration of God's blessing on his people. As was Paul's practice, John in his benediction proclaims the grace of Christ for believers. We speak of salvation by grace. We mean that salvation is a free gift of God. And here grace refers to the attitude of the Lord towards his people. Christ is filled with merciful love for all those who call on his name. And Revelation has shown Jesus as the lion the lamb who is worthy to unseal the scroll of God and to establish a divine purpose for heaven and earth. This victorious Lord looks upon his struggling people then and now with grace in his heart acting in compassion for their suffering and determined by his redeeming work to bring them with him into the new Jerusalem that is to come. Grace further refers to the power that God provides to his people in need. And in Revelation, Christ has commanded believers to overcome through faith. Will we? The answer is yes. By his grace, the people of Christ will persevere in faith so as to stand triumphant on Mount Zion together with the Lamb, Revelation 14.1 says. 
Christians are commanded to hold fast to God's word and to uphold our testimony to Jesus to the end. By the grace of Jesus, we will. The stars of the churches will shine brightly in the darkness of this world until the morning star rises to bring a new day. Christians are required to withstand the allures of the harlot and must refuse to worship the beast. We must reject false teaching from the false prophets of this world. Will the church and will Christians maintain their faith against such potent opposition? The answer for which John prays and that he declares on Christ's behalf was found in the closing benediction in verse 21, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Not merely some of Christ's people are strengthened, empowered, and secured by this grace, but John insists the grace of the Lord Jesus will save all who hear, all who believe, and all who call on his name and true faith in him. You see, this grace is sufficient to our need because it is the grace of the Lord Jesus who bears us to the love of God the Father. Charles Hodge says this, The grace of the Lord Jesus is the undeserved love of a divine person clothed with our nature, whose love has all the attributes of sinless human love, the love of the one who owns us, who is invested with absolute dominion over us, who is our protector and our preserver. The grace of this Lord, the, the Lord and Savior, Lion and Lamb, who reigns forever from the throne of God, is now and will always be able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Him, Hebrews 7.25 says. And with this benediction, we need to say that John concludes the book of Revelation. John concludes the book of Revelation right where he begins. Chapter 1, verses 1 and 5 say, The revelation of Jesus Christ, who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Looking out in faith to the same Lord and Savior at the very end, experiencing the power of his grace, hearing his promise soon to come for our salvation. We know that we can continue in faith and conquer in his name when he returns. When his promise of grace ringing in our ears, we hear our sovereign Lord claim, Surely I am coming soon, and we answer, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Well, today we wrap up this great study in the book of Revelation. We've gone through it. We've seen what it says. We've seen what it teaches. And you know what? Here's the thing as we wrap up. You know what? Christ is sovereign over all history. And that's a good thing. He's sovereign in judgment. He's sovereign in salvation. God is just. We see that personified in the cross. And we see that culminated now in his return and the establishment of his glorious the glorious kingdom of God. But even today, we, you, think, you may think, where is this? When is this going to happen? Jesus tells us we don't know the day or the hour. That's why we need to be ready. You know, how do we get ready? It's not just about checking off things in your life and, you know, giving yourself a spiritual beating by reading your Bible and praying and those things. What you need to understand is that in the midst of those things is the Lord. When you read your Bible, you're not just reading it to read it. You're reading it to discover more of Christ in every page, in every text. I'm not saying that every text has to say something about Jesus. But the whole Bible, uh, what I'm saying is that the whole Bible has a whole message that tells us about a the, the, the whole Lord and the whole Savior. From the very first, very first words to the very last words. There's, it has a message to us about the grace of the Lord Jesus. You know, as we wrap up, it's a good thing. We have a soon returning Lord. Our eyes shouldn't be fixed on the news. It shouldn't be fixed on, on what's happening in our world. It shouldn't be fixed on our trials. It shouldn't be fixed on our circumstances of our lives. Our lives should be, as verse 21 says, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. You Don't you know that this, this same grace that has saved you, it sustains you and it alone can satisfy you? This, this grace will, will lead you safely home into the 
to the New Jerusalem. So whatever is happening today, whatever, whatever struggles you might be facing, whatever things that may seem to be crippling you today, can I just plead with you? Don't be like those who add to this book, like the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Seventh-day Adventists, and many others. You want to know what you want to know for sure what's going to happen in the end? Open the book. Read it from the beginning in Genesis to the end of Revelation. Join us as we go through work through books of the Bible so that you can learn more about what the Bible teaches. This is really what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to give you my opinion about the text. That's pointless, by the way. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get you in the text to study it. That's what an expository sermon is all about. It's not about giving you my opinion about what passages mean or what things what Dave thinks about this or that or blah, blah, blah. I think that's pointless. I really do. Any, any, any preacher who's trying to do that, you shouldn't pay attention to them. What we're trying to do is simply help you understand what the text says, what it means, why it matters, how it applies to your life. Some people think, well, that's pretty simple, really. Yeah, guess what? It's, it's like in an interview, I was asked, what's your preaching idea? You know, how do you preach a sermon? And, and I said, you know what? You're going to laugh, but it's true. And my varsity golf coach in high school told me, keep it simple, stupid. You know, kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. That has... A, that has resonated in my head now now keep in mind i've read i've read the preaching books i understand all the preaching theory and all that i own about 60 or, or more preaching books so I've, I've i've read the books i i love to read preaching books but here's the thing it's one thing as martin lloyd sheds jones said to love to preach it's another thing to love people the reason that we preach, the reason that we teach is because we love people. We want to see people grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord so that they can be warned, so they can be taught rightly from the Word of God so that they will stand against error. And why is this important? We are living in a time, as we've seen throughout this book of Revelation, I promise I won't keep you very long, we're seeing in our, in our day many people fall away. That's grievous. It's sad. They love to accumulate, Paul said in 2 Timothy 4. They love to accumulate. People love to accumulate teachers around them who will itch their ears, tickle their ears. Not itch their ears, tickle their ears. Maybe you laughed at that. Okay, well, same idea. <laughs> Because people don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to hear that Christ is sovereign over all history, that only Christ can save, that only Christ can satisfy. They want to find something that is more inclusivistic. They want to meld the ideas of Christianity with other things. But as we've seen, Christ is the one who is true. He is the one who is trustworthy. And since that's true, he's the only one who can save. He's the only one who can satisfy. He's the only one that will take you into the pearly gates, into the new Jerusalem. You know, the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Muslims, the on and on, they all offer you a salvation that cannot take you into the new Jerusalem because they all offer you a salvation that God forbids. Do you know that? Verse 18 says, I warn everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away the words of the, the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in the book. That is those who twist and pervert the word of God. They will incur this judgments because the
The Bible elsewhere describes them as false teachers. Do you know that the, that the book of 1 John, that it responds to those who reject the deity of Jesus? Do you know that? I mean, one of the whole purposes, of, even of John's gospel, is to respond to those who reject the deity of Jesus. There are those who deny the deity of Christ. That means they deny Christ himself. For some of you, that will be shocking. For others of you, it won't be. That's why you need to find faithful teachers and preachers of the word who are trustworthy and reliable, who ground their ministry of the word, not in their opinions. That's why I said opinions don't matter. They ground their teaching in the word of God. They help you dig into the well of the word. And they help you grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord by extension. Those are the ministries that you should be supporting. Those are the ministries that you should be learning and growing from. I've had many conversations with people over the years. Imagine that. I've been doing this now 20 years. I've had many conversations with people. I'm not going to name names. I'm not going to name teachers. I've simply said to them, do you know that this person teaches this? Do you know that they teach that? Do you know this? Do you know that? And, I, and in so doing, I'm not saying, hey, everything that I say is correct and it's right and it's true, but you know what? I'm trying to be biblical. What these teachers are trying to do is to be novel. And there's a difference. You know, I might err, I might be wrong in many of the things that I've even said throughout the series. You know what? I'm willing to be corrected. The thing is, is that it's, there's a difference, though. There's a difference between being wrong, dead wrong, and teaching outside the Bible, and needing to grow in your understanding and knowledge of the Bible. We all, as Christians, need to be growing in our knowledge of the Bible. But the people that I'm mentioning, they don't even care. They don't care that you grow in the Bible. They just care that, you've, that you line their pocketbooks, that you listen to everything that they say, that you take them seriously. Don't dig too much into it because they, they don't really have much substance behind what they're saying. If any preacher, if any teacher, if any pastor will not take you to the Bible... If they will not help you to dig into the Bible, if they will not help you to grow in the Bible, avoid them like the plague. Here at Servants Grace, we are committed to expository sermons. Those sermons that, that focus the, the point of the passage as the point of the sermon for reasons like verses 18 and 19 talk about. You know, our goal is faithfulness to the Lord, as we've talked about. Faithfulness, whatever gift, whatever ministry God has given you, we know that Jesus Christ is returning. It's not about the rewards, but it should be about our heart's cry should be faithfulness in this life. If there's any one goal that we should be aiming the trajectory of our lives towards in light of, of eternity, it isn't more money. It isn't more fame. It isn't more glory. It's faithfulness. Faithfulness in loving the Lord. Faithfulness in loving my spouse. Faithfulness in serving the Lord with all of my heart, with all of my mind, with all my strength, with doing my job, not for the praise of a pay raise or anything, but for the glory of the Lord alone. Because, verse 20, he who testifies to these saying says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Lastly, verse 21, The grace of our Lord be with you all. Amen. Whatever you do, in all that we do, the goal of our lives should be to honor God because of all that He has done in our lives. The goal of our lives should be the grace of God. To know him, 
to love him, to serve him. Do you know that 1 Peter 5.10 says that, 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 that we serve the God of all grace? The God of all grace. And here at the very end of the Bible, God has grace for us. Grace that saves us. Grace that, that secures us. Grace that sustains us. Grace that will glorify us. Grace by which we will enter the new Jerusalem. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this great study through the book of Revelation. Thank you, Lord, for the many gifts, the talents and abilities that you've given to me and to be able to, the education that you gave me that taught me to study your word and love it, to, to dig deep, to not be afraid of the hard questions. Thank you, Lord, for helping me to grow in my ability in handling the word. Thank you even that you continue to help me do that. So, Lord, I pray that you would be honored through this, that you are honored through this series, that you will use it for the sake of your name and glory, for the equipping of your saints, for the salvation of the lost. Lord, give us a zeal and a hunger for truth. Help us to dig deep into it so that we can expose error and to stand rightly and wholly for the word of God in our generation and for all generations. In Jesus' name, we give thanks, Lord, for your word and for the Son and for the grace of God as we anticipate your eager or your, your soon and eminent return. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to the Servants of Grace podcast today. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, leave a rating on the app, and share our episode with your friends and family. If you'd like to, you can follow us on Instagram at Servants of Grace, on Twitter at Servants of Grace, or by searching Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this podcast on the front page of our website at servantsofgrace.org.